Since that period of time, I've been extremely biased towards the use of elemental sulfur for lots of different reasons. And I would be as bold enough, I would be bold enough to say that there's probably not an elemental sulfur product on the planet that I couldn't make work agronomically. And so, um, we're getting comfortable with using Tiger 90, we're getting comfortable with using Keg River sulfur. Uh, Tim, you might be familiar with Montana. They're all bentonitic sulfurs. You folks have been playing around with S15 and Mez and very other variations on the theme. And they all have their place and they all will work really, really well as long as you look at them as elemental sulfur and, and treat them as an apple instead of the ammonium sulfate orange. The whole industry always wants to compare um, wants to compare the two products and treat them the same way. They're different animals. One's a, uh, one's a big workhorse and the other one's a thoroughbred. And the way you manage different creatures is the same as you manage uh, elemental sulfur versus ammonium sulfate. Some of you have been playing around with ammonium thiosulfate. Some of you have been playing around with potassium thiosulfate. And thiosulfate is an intermediary between elemental and sulfate. So if this is sulfate here and this is elemental, thiosulfate is a breakdown product that's close to sulfate but, it's, but it's still in that whole continuum between elemental and sulfate. So before elemental can be used by a plant, it's got to be broken down from elemental sulfur to sulfate sulfur. And the beauty of, the, of that whole process is that it's biological and the only portion that lost to leaching or some other process is going to be the portion that has converted to sulfate. It's part of the reason why elemental sulfur has been used around the planet for hundreds of years. Not, not yet. Having said all of that, there are still lots of researchers out there that will tell you elemental sulfur doesn't work in Western Canada. It's the only place on the planet that it doesn't work. I've been all over this world talking to people about how to make elemental sulfur work. So the key thing for you guys to make elemental sulfur work is to realize that it's different than sulfate. Don't treat it the same as sulfate. And most of you are doing that. So how do you, what, how do you handle elemental sulfur? You broadcast it on the soil surface and you forget about it. I don't know how much simpler it can get. Because the whole deal is about particle size, dispersion, why you broadcast it. And, and when you broadcast, you let Mother Nature help you disperse that material so it comes in contact with the soil. And once it comes in contact with the soil, then the soil organisms that are in the soil, and there's hundreds of them, if not thousands of them, will begin to break down the elemental sulfur to sulfate. Most researchers will tell you there's only thiooxidants that will break down elemental sulfur. That's baloney. There's all kinds of species that will break it down. It's just that thiooxidants is the superman of elemental sulfur breakdown. And it's preferable to have the Superman in the soil. And what we've learned way back in 1980-something, um, one application of elemental sulfur will speed up the breakdown of subsequent applications. So that's kind of like elemental sulfur management in less than 10 minutes. And we figured all that stuff out 30 years ago. But these cats have done... Um, Biocycle is done, and so they, they've taken the waste base pad elemental sulfur and they're co composting it right now with grocery waste in Calgary. Do you know that we throw away about 45% of our vegetables and fruit every, every day, every day, every day, every day out of the grocery stores? And then we throw a bunch out from our households, but that's a whole another sidebar. So they collect about 30. One or two, 31 or two tons. Every day. Of grocery waste. Of grocery waste. They co compost it with the elemental sulfur, they put it in windrows. You guys all know what compost is about, they turn it, and blah, 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 and stuff. And then this is what you end up with. So, if you guys, when you go back to the thing and you haven't looked at the product, if you want to dig around there, um, you can see that it's got a wide range of particle sizes. We learned back in the early 80s that if you had particle sizes less than 150 microns you would get very rapid conversion. If you took into account that you were actually managing elemental sulfur and not sulfate sulfur and you 
work the dispersion and contact with the soil. Anything less than 150 microns, you'll get rapid conversion. There's about 9% in this jar. It's less than 150 microns. So that'll, that will convert very rapidly. The next fraction in this jar, about 36%, 35-36%, is between 150 microns and 1,000 microns. That's going to convert more slowly. There's another fraction that's uh, 1,000 microns to 2,000 microns. That's going to convert slower yet. And then there's some big chunks in there. Um, pea sizes are bigger. They're going to be slower again. So the beauty of elemental sulfur, no matter what, but especially a product like this, because of the wide range of particle sizes, if you get the rates right and you put it on the soil in a dispersed manner and you let Mother Nature help you, you will actually get release of sulfur over a long period of time. So these guys are advocating because this is 80% uh, sulfur, guaranteed uh, minimum analysis of 80% sulfur. They're advocating rates of application of 200, 220, 250 pounds per acre. And what that allows, just like the Tiger 90, the Keg River 90-85s, that allows three to four crops utilization of sulfur from that single application. They realize that some of these big chunks aren't going to break down within that three or four years, but they'll carry over for the next application. And so again, I'll say one application speeds up the second application, two applications speeds up the third application. So. The beauty of this product, in my mind, is that you get all of that stuff out of your tank for three or four years. You've got biological availability over that period of time. This stuff, because it's mixed with grocery waste and, and so on, has probably already got the organisms in there that you want to have in the soil, so it's pre-inoculated. We don't know that for sure yet. We're trying to figure that out right now. Um, to me, this is a no-brainer product. It's the simplest technology on the planet right here, except this is pretty sophisticated, simple technology. And if you think about it, this thing was a swear word about 10 years ago. But the way I see it is this thing is going to be on every farm of consequence in Western Canada within the next 10 years. Um, that's management of elemental sulfur in less than 10 minutes, in, in a nutshell. It took me three years of probably two PhDs worth of research to figure it all out, but that's a long time ago, and I can boil all that work down to uh, about that much, much uh, time. That's what we're having for supper. <laughs> yeah, it's well dessert, isn't it? It's not the sand pile for the kids to play in later. The reason we kind of got connected to this was because of a connection through Allison told me about this, and a couple other agri-coaches have been using this with their clients in Alberta for the last two years and raving to me about how good it is and how much money they were saving their clients. It's it's pretty simple. Our crops need sulfur. They need a lot of sulfur if we're going to grow baked canola crops. It improves logistics. And so we got into this for our own farm and bought a floater and made the numbers made sense for us to do that. We thought maybe we would, we would apply for a few neighbors and stuff, but these guys were really looking to work with uh, a company or someone to bring kind of sales and distribution out into into eastern Canada, eastern Canada here and into uh, Manitoba, and so Dan's kind of come on uh, taking over that that uh, company, and he'll be around uh, later today or all day today if you have any questions about that and, and pricing and logistics and all that kind of stuff. But that's essentially the nuts and bolts of it. I think it's this makes sense. And the stuff that we applied this spring, intentions were if things went well, we wanted to get it on before the crop was seeded, obviously to give it time. Most of this stuff was applied once the crop was already up, and it looks like it's doing a pretty good job. So yeah, that's the one piece I forgot. What we figured out, not back in the 80s, but in the 90s when I moved over to Alberta A, um, when you broadcast elemental sulfur, as long as you take into account the particle size differential, the biological conversion component of it, and you compensate with, for that with rate of application, that's the key thing. Whether you put it on in the fall, the spring, or after the crop seeded, the crop doesn't care. But the key is, you got to realize that this is an apple, not an orange. And if you manage it as an apple, then you're good. If you manage it like an orange, ammonium sulfate, 
two different animals. The other piece is for lots of you guys who farm in high pH soils, this creates slow acidity, right? Ammonium sulfate creates really rapid wham acidity. This creates slow biological acidity, and in certain circumstances, especially in high pH soils, that slow acidity can be a benefit, especially over a period of years. So for problem soils, for example, maybe that rate of application in zones on a variable rate basis isn't 220 pounds per acre. Maybe there's some sodium and magnesium issues that you want to deal with that are screwing up your soil texture. You might want to hit that at 500, 1,000 pounds. And that's a whole another sidebar that, um, that gets everybody in trouble with researchers. Um, because it's all that's all about soil structure and drainage and all that kind of jazz. But seen hundreds and hundreds of locations where this product can be used in those circumstances as well. Would you want the larger particle sizes more if you're doing more like a pH adjustment? No, type you, thing? you want the smaller you want stuff? The small stuff. Okay. It'll, 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 Your comment on the stem spreader, if I have my own airflow at home, yes, don't try to put it through an this, airflow. This won't go through a, a boom type okay. floater. That's one of the, the logistical challenges or the unique thing about this product. It does have to go through a spin spreader. On the application of it, when you get things tuned in right, it's actually very accurate and and what happens is the first pass, you know, the fines and, and the smaller bits only go about 46 feet. Some of the bigger ones go farther and then by the time you make the next one beside, it throws some of those bigger ones back into the middle. It's actually quite even. We did quite a bit of work with that. That was one of Harvey's uh, con big concerns and our big concerns in working with it. Uh, there will be a trusted applicator program that goes along with this, so BioCycle does not want people going out there and improperly applying it because it'll give the product a bad name or reputation that wouldn't be right. So it's not it's not rocket science, but you do need to know what you're doing. There's some, some modifications that need to be done to the machine. And if you want to kind of learn about what how it works, when you don't quite know all that and go out to the field, you can talk to Harvey. He's had some experience with that this spring and can tell you the landmines that you run into when uh, you don't really know how to handle it. So it's not that difficult to handle, just you need to know how to handle it properly. And the, you know, as, as we work more and more with this spreader and our, some of our clients are, I mean, the reality is guys like Steve LaRock have been going around measuring air cedar hoses across seeding systems and finding up to 50% variance from hose to hose from one end of the machine to the other and these things are probably spreading urea or whatever it is or are more accurate across that pattern than what we're using today through our air drills so